And uh, begin, of course, by saying my sincerest dandavat pranam to, to Gurudev. All my respects and love, obeisances, and a prayer to Gurudev that he'll help me to see clearly and to understand and to speak only truthfully. So we can. Good, I'm so happy. It gives me the force. Okay. So we continue the seva of reading uh, Bhagavad Gita with Gurudev's instructions. We have come to understand that Bhagavad Gita is an introduction to bhakti. It's an introduction to understanding Radha Mohan, not only in the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which is the most important, but also in Vedic thought in general. So we're reading Bhagavad Gita, uh, which appeared 500 years before the Common Era, as a kind of preparation for the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who appeared around 1500 of the Common Era, so 2000 years later. And this reading of Bhagavad Gita is helping us to understand the energy of prema. It's helping us to understand the energy of the goddess of prema, Radha, who is always present in Krishna and who is present in the Krishna that we find in Bhagavad Gita. So we're learning in our reading of Bhagavad Gita that all energy, but in particular, the energy of prema is already in Krishna in the form of Radharani. Last time, it was the last two, three times, we've been reading verses four to seven and trying to understand the relationship between the creation, God's creation, and what God does in the creation. We try to understand this by focusing on the three aspects of God, the three aspects of God. The one is Brahman, God as everything that exists. The second is God as Paramatma, or the collection of all souls in the universe. And the third is God as personality, Bhagavan. And we come to understand that the creation is Brahman, God as everything that exists. But then Krishna appears in all his leelas and all his activities as Bhagavan, as God with a personality. So then, we try to understand what it means that God has personality. What is a personality, we asked a bit. And we answered the question by saying, well, it's what makes something unique, something different, something that cannot, it's not for everybody, it's not universal. 
It's changing. It's flexible. It's fluid. And Bhagavan, Krishna as Bhagavan, shows these characteristics in his activities. And this is a very good thing because if Krishna were not Bhagavan, if Krishna did not have personality, then the universe would be immobile and formless, static, unmoving. But Prabhupada is teaching us in Bhagavad Gita, in the commentary of Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada and others, that God is Bhagavan and that God has personality. And that at the center of that personality is loving spiritual self. The universe is not impersonal. The universe is governed by love. And it's governed by a special kind of energy, prema shakti, the energy of love, the potency of love. The form that prema shakti takes is Radharani, the goddess of love who is present in the personality of Godhead. So understanding the universe as being governed by love and Krishna being governed by love help us understand many different things in our practice. It tells us something about faith, what, what makes faith possible through love. It tells us about parampara, what's transmitted through the generations, namely love. It helps us to understand how things happen, the energy of the universe. And maybe most important, it helps us to understand what devotion is, what bhakti is, what it means to be a devotee, a devotee of Krishna and a devotee of Radha. That's kind of a summary of, of what we've talked about now these last, these last weeks. So today we'll continue with verse 8. And if I'm, if I'm very good uh, at sharing, then we'll finish with verse 10, and we'll, then we'll have finished this phase of the chapter. So let's start by looking at verse um, 8. I'll share it with you here. Verse 8 is really, it's almost repeating. And verse 8 and 9 and 10 repeat very much the same message. That, that uh, Krishna created the universe and he's active in it. But in some way he's not involved in it. Which is a bit of a puzzle. A bit difficult to understand. Because how can he create the universe, do things in it, and not have an impact on it. And this is, the, this is the puzzle we try to sort out in this chapter. We start with verse 8, which says, The whole cosmic order is under me. It's Krishna speaking to Arjuna, of course. My will, it is by my will, it is manifested again and again. And by my will, it is annihilated at the end. I think the key to this verse 
is to understand what is meant by cosmic order. Cosmic order means the system of energies that Krishna put into place in creating the universe. Not the stones and the plants, not even the jivas, but the system of energies. He created prakriti, which is named in the, in the Sanskrit in the verse. And in modern science, we would call that probably nature. But what modern science forgets is the spiritual dimension of nature, the spiritual energy that flows there. So when Krishna talks about cosmic order, he's talking about the system of forces and energies that organize the world and that organize the souls in the world. And when he's talking about cosmic order, he's talking about the karmic system, karma. This means Krishna put in the place, into place the system of karma by which acts made in the past have an impact on the way we appear spiritually in the future. That system he puts in place. <clears throat> And then he lets the jivas go in it, the souls, he creates the souls, and they are governed by karma without Krishna even touching. So he sets the rules by creating the system and then watches happily as nature takes its course according to the rules of karma. This is one way that he acts in the universe, creates the karmic system, but does not touch what happens because it's already planned in advance. It's already programmed in advance. So let's look at the commentary then. Prabhupada says, this matter is the manifestation of inferior energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This has already been explained several times. Remember the inferior energy, this is the material energy. This is the energy that corresponds to the material objects in, in the world. All changes in the world happen through the transformation of energies. Everything that happens in the world happens because the energy in the world is changed from one form to another. From a lower form to a higher form, from a higher form to a lower form. But the energy itself is constant. It changes forms. Remember last time, and we talk about it quite often now, the, the three main energies are the external energy, that's the inferior energy, that's the maya energy, uh, it's the material energy, which is illusory. And then we have the internal energy, the spiritual energy, also called Svarup Shakti, Svarup energy. And that's the energy of, of Krishna, the energy of God. And then in between them, in between the material and the spiritual, we have the marginal energy, also called the Jiva energy, because this is the energy that all we living souls uh, have. Prabhupada continues. At the creation, the material energy is let loose as Mahat Tattva, into which the Lord, as his first Purusha incarnation, Mahavishnu, enters. 
So what's he talking about? Mahat, Mahat Tattva. This is universal goodness, the universal intelligence of the, of, the, of the world. It's the highest form of creation. Uh, mahat, mahat means highest and, and tattva means principle or principle of existence. So the energy is let loose in that highest form when the, when the universe is created. And when the Lord first comes in his parusa, self-aware, cosmic uh, being. And that's the form the universe takes at the beginning. The energy is in some way released into the world. And then it's transformed as we go. So Prabhupada continues. He lies within, this is Vishnu, Maha Vishnu, the creator. He lies within the causal ocean and breathes out innumerable universes. And into each universe, the Lord again enters as Garbodakshayi Vishnu. Par Paramatma, essentially. This is the same as Paramatma, the super soul. Each universe is in that way created. And he, Vishnu, still further manifests himself as Kishod Dakashayi Vishnu or Brahma. And that Vishnu enters into everything, into, into, even into the minute atom. This fact is explained here. He enters into everything. So that's the introduction of Paramatma, God as Paramatma, and God as Brahma. God as super soul and God as, as uh, reality of existence. And now comes the part where the system of karma is discussed by Prabhupada. Prabhupada says, Now, as far as living entities are concerned, they are impregnated into this material nature. And as a result of their past deeds, they take different positions. So the souls are put into the material reality and depending on their past acts, their past deeds, they take different energy positions, different spiritual positions, higher or lower, closer to the spiritual level or less close to the spiritual level, all as a function of what they uh, accomplished or did in previous times. So Krishna creates the karmic system, places the jivas in the system, and then they go to the place where they, are, they belong based on the rules of, of the karmic order. And thus, Prabhupada says, the activities of the material world begin. The activities of the different species of living beings are begun from the very moment of the, of the creation. So the energy is there from the start, the energy of the jivas, and they carry out their lives based on their placement in the karmic order. Prabhupada continues. It is not that all is evolved. That is, at the creation, everything's not completely involved. We, we still have some evolution to do. The different species of life are created immediately along with the universe. Men, animals, beasts, birds, everything is simultaneously created. Because whatever desires the living entities had 
at the last annihilation are again ma ma manifested. So in the last universe, the spiritual position they held will be recreated. They, the position they held at their death will be recreated and placed in the new universe. Prabhupada says, it's clearly stated that the living entities have nothing to do with this process. The state of being in their past life, in the past creation, is simply manifested again. And all this is done simply by his will. And that will, his will, the will of the creator of Vishnu, takes the form of the creation of the karmic system, of the cosmic order. So he doesn't create the, the he doesn't uh, assign the different levels of the, the jiva, he creates the order, and the jivas in a way are given automatically their place in the order. And finally, Prabhupada says, this is the inconceivable potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And after creating different species of life, he has no connection with him, with them. The creation takes place to accommodate the inclinations of various living entities. And so the Lord does not become involved with it. Those incl inclinations he's talking about are the the karmic situations created in past lives and in past universes. So this is one argument that Prabhupada is trying to explain how Krishna can be active in the world, have leelas, have activities, and at the same time not be active, not be evolved. In the next verse the, and the short the commentary, the argument continues. So in verse 9, O Dananya, all this work cannot bind me. I am ever detached, seated as though neutral. I'm detached and neutral, says, says Vishnu. I'm not bound. I find this very difficult to understand. We're, 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 referring to, we're referring to the system of karma, to the activities of the world that are determined by the last life. And Krishna has set the rules for this. He's made the cosmic order for the world. But in doing so, I wonder, and this is a mystery for me, how can he not be attached to the order that he creates? Is there some kind of, a different kind of attachment than just personal interest in each little jiva? Can Krishna be detached and attached at the same time? So somehow creating the system of, of karma with attachment and then being detached while watching the system function. So in a way that Krishna seems present and not present. So how do we understand this? I think Prabhupada tries to tell us something about this in the commentary. Let's look. He says, one should not think in this connection, that the Supreme Personality of Godhead has no engagement. In his spiritual world, he is always engaged. There's the clue, I think. In his spiritual world, says Prabhupada, he's always engaged. Prabhupada almost seems to contradict Krishna, or at least he's, he's close to my understanding as well, that, or my question. And the solution is, for Prabhupada, 
that Knishna is unattached to the material creation, but he's attached to the spiritual creation. He's unattached to the material creation, but attached to the spiritual creation. So he's very interested in what happens on the spiritual level, disinterested about the material level. And in the marginal level, the in-between where the jivas are, then you could say marginally interested. And this is confirmed, if you like, by a citation from Brahma Samhita, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago before. Here's the citation. He is always involved in his eternal, blissful, spiritual activities. But he has nothing to do with these material activities. Material activities are being carried on by his different potencies. So the material activities are automatically following the karmic rules. But the spiritual activities, he's very interested in, Krishna. He's blissfully interested in them. Material activities happen together with external energy, maya shakti. Jiva activities are carried out with the marginal shakti, the jiva shakti. And according to Brahma Samhita, Krishna is involved with spiritual activities. In other words, spiritual is another name for involved. To be spiritual is to be involved. I cannot be involved with a stone because the stone has no soul. But anything that has a soul, anything, requires my involvement. Anything that has a soul demands my involvement. It's impossible not to be involved with something that has a soul. And this links to the discussion we had in one of classes about dependence. Two weeks ago, I think. It explains dependence and independence for us. We said two weeks ago that to have a soul means to be dependent on other souls, to be linked to other souls, to be linked to Radha Mohan, the super soul. And that anyone who says they've forgotten their, it says they're independent, has forgotten their soul. This is what we said. In the same way, Krishna is involved with jivas because they have souls and because Krishna is the super soul, the paramatma. Krishna is not involved with material aspects, but Krishna is involved in the spiritual aspects. And finally, you probably guess I'm coming around to it. How is he involved? Through loving devotion. It's the devotional love that makes out the involvement of Krishna in our lives and our lives in Krishna. And the energy of that devotional love, you already know the answer, is the Radha Rani. This involvement is Radhadani reaching out one hand to the jiva and the other hand to Krishna and bringing them together. Prabhupada says then, the Lord is always neutral in the material activities of the created world. This neutrality is explained here. He has control over every, although, sorry, although he has control 
over, over every minute detail of matter, he is sitting as if neutral. The example can be given of a high court judge sitting on his bench. By his order, so many things are happening. Someone is being hanged, someone is being put into jail, someone is awarded a huge amount of wealth, but still he is neutral. That's in the material way. Then Prabhupada continues. He is nothing, he has nothing to do with all that gain and loss, the material gain and loss. Similarly, the Lord is always neutral. Although he has his hand in every sphere of activity. And then Prabhupada says, in the Vedanta Sutra, it is stated the same thing. He is not situated in the dualities of the material world. He is transcendental to these dualities of the material world. And Prabhupada continues, nor is he attached to the creation or annihilation of the material world. The living entities, the jivas, take their different forms in the various species of life, various kinds of life, according to their past deeds, according to the karmic principles, and the Lord doesn't interfere with them. And yet, let me, I have to stop sure because I have to look you in the eye. <laughs> and yet what the living entities do, what the jivas are doing, involves their spiritual selves. The stones are doing nothing. The jivas are doing. And what they're doing involves the spiritual selves. Krishna is not involved in the, he's not involved in the, in the creation of the, he's involved in the creation of the cosmic system for the material side, but for the immaterial side, the spiritual side, he's quite involved, quite involved and engaged in both the marginal activity, so the, the lives of the jivas and the external activity. That's the, the spiritual level. Hmm. On the spiritual level, where Krishna is fully engaged, this is where his personality, the personality of Godhead, becomes active. Hmm. This is where the energy of Svarup lies. This is the energy of our constitutional positions waiting for us. That's where the energy of love lies on the spiritual level. And this is, the, this is where the energy of Radha lies. So it's just one more wonderful way of, of understanding, for example, the difference between the Upanishads, this very philosophical, theoretical, set of verses, wonderful verses that exists a bit earlier, earlier than Bhagavad Gita, the difference between Upanishad and Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita follows all the principles and philosophies of the Upanishads. But the, the enormous difference is that in Bhagavad Gita, you have personality, you have engagement. You have a God who cares. You have Leela. You have love. You have devotion. You have Dada. So Upanishad, in a way, talks about a world in which God does nothing. It's, it's the world as Brahman. It's God as Brahman. Um, and Bhagavad Gita talks about the engagement of God in the world. So now we finish this sequence, if you like, with verse 10. I'll share it again here. Let's see. Da, da, da. Nope, not that one. Wrong one. There.
Verse 10. The material nature is working under my direction. O son of Kunti. The material nature is working under my direction. And it's, it is producing all moving and unmoving beings. By its rule, by the cosmic order, this manifestation, this creation, is created and annihilated again and again. So Prabhupada comments then. It is clearly stated here that the Supreme Lord Although aloof, although detached from all the activities of the material world, remains the supreme director. This is in the sense that he's the one who created the order. He created the karmic system, the cosmic regulating principles. So in that sense, he's, he's Mahavishnu, the supreme director. Prabhupada says, the supreme lord is the supreme will, the, the supreme will power, and the background of this material manifestation. But the management is being conducted by material nature, so without inter intervention, without involvement. And then Prabhupada continues, Krishna also states in Bhagavad Gita, I think it's in book four, that all of the living entities, all the jivas, in different forms and species, um, uh, let's see. Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita that all of the living entities in different forms and species, I am the father. I am the father to all these living entities. The father gives seeds to the womb of the mother for the child. And similarly, the Supreme Lord, by his mere glance, injects all the living entities into the womb of the material nature. And they come out in their different forms and species according to their last desires and activities. So once again, according to the karmic principles, according to the system of karma. He continues, all these living entities, though born under the glance of the Supreme Lord, still take their different bodies according to their past deeds and desires. So the Lord is not directly attached to this material creation. So again, Prabhupada is presenting this idea of the karmic system that's, that governs the way that material beings appear. But then again comes a mystery. It's really the same mystery as in the last verse. What is this relation? without attachment. And what is this glance? You see, in the middle of the commentary by Prabhupada, he says, because Krishna glances over material nature, he is undoubtedly activity. Uh, there is undoubtedly activity on the part of the Supreme Lord. He glances over material nature there is undoubtedly activity. So again, it's a bit of a contradiction. He says, because he glances, he, there is an involvement of Krishna in, in the life of, of the jivas. But what I really want to point out to you is this word glance. It's a beautiful word. word. And remember, we talk about the sidelong glance of Radhika, the power of that glance, the force of that glance. And remember, too, that the commentary, the purport, is written by Prabhupada in English. 
it's not a translation. He chose the word glance. And so what I want to ask is, what is this glance? What is the power of this glance? What is the connection of this glance? This is the glance that we see in the eye of Radharani when she's looking to Krishna. But let's continue. I won't get ahead of myself. <laughs> Prabhupada continues. He simply, oh, I did that one. Because he glances over material nature, I did that one too. Sorry, I'm sorry. The example then comes. Here we go. I'm too excited here. Then he gives an example, not of something mechanical and, and stone-like and hard and impersonal. He gives the example of the fragrance of a flower. The relation of Krishna to the jivas is the relation of a, a nose to the fragrance of a flower. Here's what he says. The example is given in the Smriti. When there is a fragrant flower before someone, the fragrance is touched by the smelling power of the person. Yet the smelling and the flower are detached from one another. There is a similar connection between the material world and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Actually, he has nothing to do with this material world, but he creates by his glance and ordains. Now, I don't know what you think, but to me, the fragrance of flower is the most sensual connection between a nose and an object that you can even imagine. It's more, it, it, it creates emotions in a more powerful way than just about anything else the odor of a flower, the odor of a perfume. And this is the example of the connection that Prabhupada gives to us. A fragrance isn't an automatic robot system of control. A fragrance is a sign of... A fragrance is a sign of beauty. It's a sign of love. It's a sign of emotion. It evokes a, an emotional relation between between Krishna and, and the jiva. It's not the fragrance of the material part of the material world that touches Krishna and which he, through which he has a relation to jivas. The fragrance is the spiritual relation between Krishna and the jiva. It's the, it's the devotional, loving relation. A fragrance is not pure material energy. It's evocative energy. It's, it's affect. It's emotion. And this is what this is the example that Prabhupada gives us to describe how how Krishna is is related to the world. And I think it's just a beautiful way to see it, and it's the perfect introduction to the next verses, which we'll we'll begin with next time, which tell us more about what this devotional relationship uh, can be and 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 is. So then we can take the the very last line of the very last line of. Um, the commentary from Prabhupada, he says, in summary, material nature without the superintendence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So material nature without the control of the Supreme Personality of Godhead cannot do anything. What? What's going on? We just said before that he wasn't controlled. And now there's a control through this fragrance, through this, through this evocative, emotional uh, link. Yet the Supreme Personality is detached from all material activities. So conclusion, material, from material activity, there is, no, there is no interaction, no involvement, no engagement. But everything that rises above that in the heart, in the soul of the jiva, and all the way up to the purely spiritual level, here Krishna is involved. Involved in our lives, involved in our spiritual lives on the spiritual level. And the link, the, the, the diplomat between these two levels is, of course, Radharani. She is the one who's assuring this connection, the, the, the loving energy, which is that connection between the two levels. 
then there's where we stop today with the text. And there's time for some questions or sharing or comments or hopefully a um, comment from Gurudev if we're so lucky. Thank you so much, Udavaya, for sharing. Hmm. It's amazing how uh, little technical verses you managed to make so much juice out of them. <laughs> I'm <just thinking laughs> but can you can you give some more? Uh, uh, hints to where you're going when you were speaking about the glands because this was very very beautiful that you kind of pulled that out of the of the text do you have some more thoughts that you didn't share can we get a preview for the no next preview. <laughs> <laughs> well I mean I could try I, it, I, I thought it was very surprising to find this example that that Prabhupada gives that the engagement of Krishna is only like a glance. Because on, its, uh, on the one hand, it's, well, on the one hand, as I said, it's, the, it's this image that we have from, um, from um, Vilapakus Manjari and Narada Rasa Sudaniti. We see it again and again in the, in, the, in, the, in the tradition after Mahaprabhu. It's so common. So I, it's, just a, it's not a coincidence, I believe. But then on the other hand, what's so beautiful about a glance is it's the lightest touch we can have on the world. It's not a stare. It's not a penetrating, invasive examination. It's the lightest touch we can have with our senses on the world, just a caress of the world with our eyes. And we just see it and we move on. And we it's almost the lightness of it which creates the, the experience uh, of it. And I can imagine this is the most loving way that God could have a relationship to the world, is with utter lightness. You know, it's not the Abrahamic, Abrahamic lightning bolts and floods and, and all the rest. It's just this light touch of, of love, this caress that he gives, in this example at least, that I think is a really beautiful way of looking forward to the age of Mahaprabhu and the, and the lightness and the sweetness which we try to, you know, re recreate in our practice, in our devotional practice every day. It's that sweetness we want. It's not the lightning bolts and floods and pestilence and frogs and, and the rest. Yeah, it's really, it's really very beautiful, and uh, it also made me think about the importance that we put to to darshan. Of course, because of course. whenever we go to to see Radha Mohan, or it's always about that glance, and it's it's not about me only seeing her or you know Radha Mohan, but it's also them seeing me, and it's that interaction that happens in darshan is also about the glance, both 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 from both sides. So actually, in that sense, one can feel that it's a reciprocal glance. It's not only, you know, the Lord glancing upon me, but it's also me recognizing that glance and, and reciprocating. Absolutely. This is so important that uh, I didn't come into my mind, but darshan, of course, means to see. And when we take darshan of Radha Mohan, we go and see and let ourselves be seen. We take darshan of Gurudev, we go and we let us, there's a reciprocal scene, yeah. Of course. I mean, the eye is so important in, 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 uh, in bhakti, the eye, the vision. Hmm, beautiful, yeah, very important. I'm One other it. thing which came to me, actually, before you came to the second verse, so when we were already in the first one and you were talking about the judge that looks 
And then in, I already started thinking about father and mother, you know. Ah. Because I think very often we speak of this and Gurudev always speaks of that. So when in the next verse, you, it was about the father, it was like, yeah, it, <laughs> it's, it's quite clear because even if one takes the example in this living world, the father gives the seed, mm -hmm. right? But from that point onwards, the the exchange is uh, is is the uh, is the job of the mother. Mm. Yeah. So she has to she has to give the the life. Actually, she has to sustain that. She has to caress that life mm. and put it in front of the father. Can you unmute, Kopika? We missed the last part. Yes. The very last sentence. I was, I was just saying that um, that actually uh, Gurudev always speaks of um, of the mother of Radharani, you know, as how she is our spiritual mother, hmm. and she is the one who nurtures us, who nurtures our our soul, hmm. and and even in material life, the father gives the seed, but if the mother would not say, "Look, this is your father." Exactly. The, the child would not know who is the father. This is yeah. this is the mother's work <laughs> to to make that connection. Right. So I didn't have a solution to that. It was just a thought. <laughs> no, that's good. Whenever we say the word father, we never say it somehow without mother being attached. You know, it's like two sides of the same coin. Mm. So that just uh, was a resonance with you that when you said that what is that energy? It's, it's Radharani, you know, like yeah, it's always yeah, yeah. her. Making it's always her, which is the binding connection in between. It's always love which connects that. Yes. And I think Gurudev has said too that you have to actually trust the mother. The father has to trust the mother that she tells it was you. <laughs> You're the father because the, the current connection is indirect. Or it's in the past, the direct, the direct connection. So in the same way, the jiva recognizes through love, no? That's how we recognize that connection. Yeah. Right. That's the only way to recognize it, exactly. That's the only way. Lovely. Okay, any other sharing today? All right, then I wish you um, a good week, and I'll see you in the meetings. and. Thank you very much. Without the running.